Welcome to Pastor's Conversation. We're here with Ryan, and we're going to be uh, exploring his teaching tonight in Matthew 5 on persecution and response. But I got a couple of early questions for you. Sure. Um, why does Jesus in the Beatitudes refer to the kingdom as present in verses 3 and 10, but everything else is future. What, what, do, you, what do you make of that? Consistency, I can say, because uh, he describes the kingdom, again, as being something that is eternal. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done. So it's something that's beyond us. And he describes it as being something that's internal, which is, you know, the kingdom is near, it's within you. Um, and then, you know, he, he preaches repent for the, for the kingdom is now, you know, and so there's, I think the idea is that we, we are so in love with defining everything and having everything on a, a perfect little, this is exactly what he means in exactly this setting where the kingdom is very elastic and it seems to be like the way it's being described. It is all that God has done, all that he intends to do right. and all that is happening. So right. all, even even the things that like well, those are specifics like intends, this is God's will, but we're trying to thwart that will on a regular basis through our sin, disobedience, and rebellion. Right. And even then, God uses that as part of His kingdom, and to accomplish His will. So, but I, was, yeah. I was it was an interesting when I caught that, and I don't mm. know if, that that all of the promises of the blessedness come in the future shall, except for. 3 and 10 when he says is. Mm -hmm. So somehow I, I, in, in the context of this teaching of his, he, would you agree, or not agree, it's not, I, do you think he's saying that the blessing of these happen now as a, the reward of the blessing is now, whereas the others are, shall be, will be, future tense. Or, or well, how would, why do you think he makes that distinction within this pithy 12 verses? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, because there, you would love to reach out and grab some sort of awesome, aha, this, right. is, this is amazing. But it's just, it just seems to be a shift that serves his purpose that I don't understand. Um, it, if it would it change the meaning if it was future? Oh, not at all. And would any of the others... Would it change the meaning, blessed are the merciful because they are being shown mercy? I mean, that sounds just as good. Uh, you know, you got to wonder. Well, he says, shall be, shall be, mm -hmm. let's see, shall be, shall be, shall be, shall be. And then he goes, right, when he talks about the king, it's just an interesting, yeah. he, when he talks about the kingdom, for theirs is the kingdom. I'm still trying to figure what, um, I mean, it, the kingdom is past, present, and future. The kingdom is something that will be tangible and something that resides within our heart. But I, I think you're right that it, it has so many flavors to it. Um, well, you know, there's that old now, not yet principle. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and for those that don't know, I mean, that's the idea of, you know, Christ has come and Christ will come. You know, we, we have been made fully new in Christ and are completely changed. And yet we're still in the process of sanctification or change. And so it's, it has happened, but not quite fully. We haven't experienced it fully yet. I mean, there's this constant tug of war between what's happening now and what will happen. Yeah. And maybe for no other reason other than just to cause you to, notice and scratch your head and wonder how does what what does Jesus mean by this like right. I think it's perfectly fine for everyone to step back from some of these more um, you want to call it poetic parts of, of scripture and right. say that's interesting I'm not 100% sure how to describe well, to tell you what, exactly what that means but it could mean this or it could mean this or it could mean none of these things and it could just be a litor a lit you know, something, a literary flourish of some sort. Do you think the kingdom at its core is Christ's rule? 
or is it something else at its core? Well, I mean, when he, he and John the Baptist both, when they started their ministry, that was, you know, repent, turn from the past into this future. What's the future? The kingdom is near. The kingdom of God is now. And that was him. Like, he was the initiation of the kingdom. There was not some event that took place that then opened the kingdom. In the same way that, like we talked last week, you know, God is righteousness. Right. Because there is no one... I mean, there's no one to tell him what to do, but he still is righteousness. He still is love, even if no one loves him. Um, you know, in this case, you know, Jesus is the full embodiment of what all that God intends to do, uh, even if even if we don't understand him. I mean, he it doesn't change his nature and and who he is. Right. Yeah. I, I to me, it's an interesting concept that the kingdom of God or the our kingdom of heaven is any place where Christ rules, whether it be in our heart mm. or in our realm or in a relationship. Where he rules is his kingdom. Would you agree or not agree? I do. I just, I wonder, I mean, like these Beatitudes are, they're like, they're not just inspirational, but they're, they're like first aid for bleeding, hurting people. Okay. You know, and... And he's giving people that are, are that are struggling, that are being persecuted, or you know, because when by the time they're reading Matthew's gospel, I mean, they they are 100. percent They're they're being persecuted. They have been persecuted. They're going to be persecuted. Um, what will it take for them to hold tight, to hold fast, to make it through? I mean, how should they respond? They should respond with mercy. They should be peacemakers. They should not lash out at their enemies. They should instead try to go that extra mile. I mean, there's there's all this incredible encouragement from the Lord and there's this constant um, call for us to set aside the things of the world and take up the things of, of Christ I mean would you, would you say five six and seven is Christ establishing what his rule looks like on earth nah I think the resurrection does a better job okay so the role of five six and seven mm. is what is it the new Ten Commandments? No, is it? no gosh, no. Okay, no what, what, what is he, he, three chapters, pretty long teaching. Yep. What's, what's he saying to us? Uh, is it so many things. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, but what's the sum total of it? Yeah. It's describing the character and the struggle, the storm and the, the struggle, right? The, the, the point of crisis. There's this, the old German theologian used to call it this, the storm and strain, like the, the, conf, the conflict within us. And you, you, need, you need to come to grips with your inadequacy while also embracing the one who makes you fully whole. And every, every slice of this, this, this teaching does that but in a, such a relatable way that everyone understands. I mean, everybody understands what it's like to have, in their environment, to have a soldier come to you and tell you, hey, peasant, carry my bags, I don't want to carry them. You know, and to grumble and gripe and to drag the bags and be a jerk about it. And he's saying, that's not what my people should be like. You, know, you need to be of such strength of character that you would willingly not only carry the, the one mile he asks, but go to. Right? Go beyond what the world expects you to be, even when people are persecuting you, insulting you, and saying all kinds of terrible things about you do, because of me. Do you think Jesus, in one sense, is trying to get the religion, religiosity off of them into a more essence of what the kingdom and life and living mm. and behavior and character really is, as opposed to well, what they I mean, might have thought it was? I don't think Jesus would have been crucified if the Pharisees had picked up on the Beatitudes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> At least if he was, it would be through somebody else. It wouldn't have been them. So, I mean, just even those basics, um, of course, if they had just followed the Ten Commandments, it probably wouldn't have happened either. But the, um, you know, these are basic descriptions of who we are, not necessarily what you aspire to be. You know? Why shouldn't you engage in lust? Well, it's because that's not who you are, right? You are salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Right. It's not it's not that somehow by engaging in lust, you are now a corrupted being that of no value and use to God. It's like, no, no, live out your character. This is who you are, who Christ has made you to be. This is the character that that he wants 
for us to exude. It's what he's working in us to create through his spirit, through his people. And, and these are the, some of the scenarios and examples of how does that, what does that character look like when it's coming out of you? Okay. You, know? you made an early clarification for Christians about what persecution is and what it isn't, <laughs> which I thought was great. Yep. Um, why, do, why do you think Christians minimize I mean, we'll take, uh, I didn't get my parking place, so I'm persecuted, or she said no to me, I'm per what, Why do we minimize as opposed to see it the way you laid it out as this? Well, it's more romantic to be persecuted for Christ than it is to, to just suffer because life is kind of hard and suffering is real. Um, you know, if I lose my job, it's a whole lot better for me to assume that I've lost my job because I'm a Christian. Okay rather than right. own the fact that maybe it's because I showed up late a lot or because I had a bad attitude with the boss. I mean, like, that hurts. I don't want to think about that. It's a whole lot easier for me to assume that that girl doesn't want to go out with me because I'm a Christian. So you made a clear distinction. I mean, I, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking, I'm, I'm amazed at how surprised Christians are that when they are persecuted, mm. and yet the New Testament is a book written just all about it you know you got james chapter one first okay. peter chapter one hebrews chapter 11 i mean we could rattle these yeah. off and go why are we so surprised that we signed we we signed up some, yeah. for something different than than the well, promise why do you think why do you think the the modern let's just talk about like our peers okay okay the modern christian who has attended the American church would be surprised. Like, what is it that you think that they've had in common that leads us to be shocked and surprised by it? I think you identified it tonight when you, they, in some ways, accepted a gospel of happiness mm -hmm. than truth. Right. They, they were set up to think it was going to be easy, not hard. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, when you've done this with James, I bet. But, you know, we are not a sheltered people. We are scattered people you know we are a, peter an exiled mm -hmm. group we're not a uh, easy group um i think somewhere the gospel the american gospel got a little tweaked mm -hmm. and we, we we accepted jesus to make us happy rather than accepted jesus to make us like himself yeah i mean last week i, I referenced uh, matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 uh you know jesus says come to me if you're burdened you know, take my yoke upon you, I'm gentle, humble in nature, my, right. my burden is light. Right. I think we have totally misunderstood what his, his yoke is. Okay. You know, his yoke is real. It is the, the weight of being like Christ. It is joining with Christ. It is being in Christ. Okay. That's his yoke. And yes, it is easy because we're not in charge of that. You know, it is us in him, not trying to, f for us to figure out how to squeeze him into us. And, and so I think a lot of people just have become very much expectant that everything that God wants from you is going to be easy and light because we hear those words. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Jesus yeah. is gentle. So everything should be going my way and be gentle. And, you know, God works all things together for, for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So that means everything should always work to, for, for good. And if it's not, well, it must be the devil. It must be somebody per attacking me and persecuting me. Do you think that Christians need to awaken to the fact that the persecution, if it hasn't hit them because they are connected to Christ and a follower of her and follower of him and living out the light and being salt, that there's, there may be more persecution in the next 10 years than in the last 50? There may be, but also like, if you're not experiencing any pushback, any blowback for your faith in Christ, right? How much like Jesus are you really? Right. I mean, go into even a church office, like even in our church. Like if if somebody came in and actually acted like Jesus here, uh, we'd be freaking out. I mean, if he was like, "Oh, hey, I'm going to go around and start healing people," and and uh, guys, you know, like none of this stuff matters. Let's focus on it. I mean, like just like the way he would radically probably reorient our days and our schedules, and I mean, just. We wouldn't tolerate that. We wouldn't put up with it. Uh, if Jesus came and preached here every week, I mean, it might be awesome, but I don't think it would last very long because he's, he, 
he cuts us. Well, and you said real clear, and I thought compelling, that darkness doesn't like the light. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to be light and salt and you're going to be redemptive, darkness doesn't mm -hmm. want to be exposed, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. want to think it's, it's bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the, the, you know, the, the spirit of our times, right? It's, Everybody can do everything that they want to do, and everyone's right, except... Except, no, no, I love that, go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> except if, honestly, except if you're someone who says that these Judeo-Christian principles are real. That's the only group that's yeah. going to get persecuted, in many ways. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I saw it where, like, say, in Australia, you know, you'd see that every... Couples from every religion, families from every religion, and you know, you've got multiple wives in some settings, you've got a, a lot of stuff that's illegal, that's actually not accepted by wider society. No one ever speaks against it because that doesn't really bother anybody. Honestly, if it did, they'd say something, they'd do something about it, but they don't. But the minute uh, a Christian person is on the TV or on the news or whatever and starts to speak biblical truth, uh, even, even kind things, you know, people start losing their minds and saying, like, you, you can't do that here. And it's just a, everything's been upside down forever. And I, we act as though sometimes like, this is the first time it's ever happened. We're the first people that have ever gone For through sure. anything terrible. Yeah. And I would take them back to Peter, who says, like, you haven't even resisted to the point of shedding blood yet. So, shh, you know, talk to me when that happens. Right. Yeah. Because we have, you know. <laughs> You know, looking at a guy like Paul who's you know, fought wild beasts in the arena for Christ. And, and some don't, you wanna, don't you want to see that? That's, you go make that movie. I want to watch that. Yeah, right. But <laughs> the church grew under persecution almost more than it has grown under affluence. Yeah, but I mean, I think the greatest act of early church persecution wasn't from Rome and it wasn't violence. It was from within. Yeah. It was the, the Marcionites. It's the creation of a false church that, that accepted half of the gospel. Right. You know, and that grew and outpaced the, the true church and looked like it was going to be the dominant uh, bearer of the name of Jesus. Right. And then, thank God, it, it just fizzled and died. It's still around. But... You know, that was the greatest threat that we faced. I mean, the, um, the attacks and the physical stuff, you know, I think it drew a lot of sympathy towards the church. I mean, people saw women and children and men standing in defiance in the name of Jesus, refusing to attack back and dying, right. you know, right in front of them. That's, that's visceral and it gets your attention. Where today, you know, I think people just sit around and wring their hands and worry about what everybody's doing, and there's nothing super attractive about the way that we resist. Well, I, Peter would say the dross is being cleaned off mm -hmm. through persecution in a way that convenience and comfort and materialism and hedonism doesn't clean off the dross. It, yeah. it accumulates it. Yeah, it's more. I mean, if, you're, if your goal is to try to reach some sort of worldly standard, you'll never get it because it's constantly shifting and moving, right? And, and that's the trick, that's the game. It's been that way forever. And that's why it's something that never satisfies and it never ends. Where, you know, in, in the reality, the, the real biblical Christianity, there, there is a very clear, this is the goal. And the goal is acceptance of Christ, belief in him, taking steps of faith, inviting him into all, all the parts of your life. And as you do that sort of, it, you, you may never attain anything except righteousness and the change that he brings into your heart and the way that you're born from the inside out. I mean, it's, it's so different from the world. The world is like, come on, keep chasing, keep chasing. One day you'll catch us. Where Christ has come to us, sits with us, he takes from us our, our mess and, right. and is begging us to take his good. You know, that's, that's attainable in that sense, where, where the world's mess is never going to be attainable. Which, well, yeah, anyway. That's a, how, how should, um, what should we do in persecution? 
the real pers the the right kind of persecution, not she mm -hmm. said no to me. Yeah. What? How should a Christian live while being persecuted? What would you say to somebody who's experiencing true, whether it's Middle East or here? What's our response? Well, I mean, I, I do again think you'd take you back to these beatitudes. It starts you there. I mean, they're a, they're a salve for your wounds. They're um, a reminder that you know those who are gentle and humble in nature, you know, you're, you're going to inherit so much more. Like there's, there's this idea of, you know, exhibit these characteristics, even in times of hardship, struggle, trial. And as you do, God's going to make good in some way, even if it's not in this world, you're, you're going to be okay. Like he's going to walk with you through this. And it's, it's, I would just sit and work back through that. I mean, we have, I've been in Cambodia and our last church, we had a, a mission there, and we spent a lot of time in a communist country that actively rounds up Christians and burns their houses to the ground. I mean, it happens frequently, and we've been there with them. You know, we've we've sat with families who have lost the, all of their worldly possessions. And your statement or message or quiet whisper is what to them? Well, at first we just weep with them. Okay. Right? And we try to find them housing and we try to, you know, you try to absorb them into the life of the church in some capacity and make good on, on their needs. Okay. You know, you, you weep with them and then you begin to try to help them rebuild and restart. I mean, it's, it's just about, okay, they knocked you down. Let's stand back up. You know, and I've had real sit down, long conversations with, you know, a father whose son was beheaded because of his faith. I, you know, I wouldn't say anything trite or silly to I that person, that. Right. You know, except to sit with them and to try to experience their pain in some capacity. And when they're ready, you know, you try to encourage them to return to these principles. Like, how should you treat those who did this to your son? Well, you should be merciful. You should try to be a peacemaker, not, not go after them, not try to destroy them. Uh, remain pure in your heart. Like, don't don't engage in with the wickedness of vengeance. You know, those are, it's this character shaping that takes time, takes, takes the spirit at work in us, but, and it takes a people around you to remind you of that. You, you're not gonna get, trust me, if somebody does that to me, I'm gonna need a team of people to, uh, to hold me back and constantly be telling me, not, don't do it, don't do it. Don't go after those people, don't crush them, don't, don't hate them. Because my everything in me is going to want to do that, and and that's w what I have seen and have experienced in the smallest possible way of sitting with somebody who's experienced that pain. Um, but I've also seen the other side of that, where forty years later, you know, I had a, a guy in my last church. His father was was killed for his faith in front of his family in India. Awesome man, and the, the son that we knew was is an awesome minister that. God has just used him in ways that would have made his dad proud. He would have happily given his life to see his son be used in the name of Jesus all around the world like that. You know, those are the things that, like, perspective and time change things. Mm -hmm. Does it hurt? Yeah, of course it hurts. But it hurts less when you, when you think about, from that perspective, that, that, wow, your dad must be really, would, must be proud of you. Must be saying, well done, son. Like, look what you've accomplished in the name of Christ. And my pain is what brought you there. It's a, I don't know, the kingdom, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's same, all of it. Yeah, yeah. The similar story. When I was in Bangladesh, met a beautiful young couple, 23 and 21 married, mm -hmm. doing mission work in Bangladesh. Uh, and I went back a year later and she had, she had passed away um, based on a mission trip. And what was struck me is when I went to him and I, I, we became instant friends the year before, when I went up and embra embraced him, he said, Bill, it is God's will. I mean, that depth of faith mm. that most, most of us might say, I'm out, I'm done, where was God when it hurt? And his, I mean, just the, the beauty of that refining process for mm. believers does take them somewhere in persecution yeah. that, um, you know, there's, there's hundreds of verses on what you taught, but I, w I was struck by first Peter two, when he talks about 
the suffering and persecution and, and that Jesus continued to entrust himself. And I just thought, I, I think a lot of Christians miss out on the opportunity in the midst of their persecution to do exactly what Jesus did, not retaliate, but kept entrusting himself. And I thought, I, I don't know if that's our first response. Well, of course not. Not our first response. Right. If it does happen, it's, it's by the grace of God, and it's God in you doing it. You know, it's, uh, I was talking with somebody after church tonight, same, same scenario, just like the, the only way she didn't respond in anger towards this problem was because she just felt like the Holy Spirit just kind of literally put her hand over her mouth. She couldn't say a word. You know, and you think, good. You know, sometimes we need that. Yeah. We need that intervention because on our own, in our own strength, we're, we're just... Yeah, I want to. I want to hit back. You're going to swing at me. I'm going to crush you. You know, you're going to insult me. I'm going to destroy you. Uh, you know, there's, you know, peace through victory. You know, that's that's how my brain's wired, and it's taken a, a lot of time for God to sort of help me see that there's a place for that, and in His kingdom, that place is. Yeah, that that impulse is going to be happy rewired to something a lot more useful than yeah. uh, sort of the worldly approach. So the takeaway tonight, if, if, uh, if you laid your head on your pillow and said, I think God used me the way I wanted to be used, I yielded myself because they heard, they are learning, they are becoming, mm. well, in light of persecution, what would that be? Well, resilience is built by preparation. Okay, good statement. Yeah. So if you want to be prepared for the future, you start today in maybe the good times and that's when you prepare for the bad times. Okay. Right? You don't, yeah. Resilience, you don't start learning about resilience and growing in resilience when you experience tragedy. Like if you don't, if you didn't have it prior to that, you're, it's going to be a long, hard road. And so I, I think in a large part, that's what this teaching is all about. I mean, it's, it's the, hey, church, be prepared. This is your future. But, but don't let your heart be troubled, for I have overcome. Like, I'm going to be there with you every step. And I am your strength, and I am also your reward. Keep your eyes on me. And, you know, that's, that's what this teaching is, uh, is aiming toward. But, you know, there's, there's so many other things you could say about it. I mean, like, there's, right. there's a million things you could take away from the, the description of salt and light. I mean... There's just no end to, to some of these teachings. Right. And you can just get lost in them swimming around and all the stuff that could be said. One of the fun thoughts I had one time, it's been a while, is that both salt and light are silent. And we tend to think of the Christian life as loud, cognitive proclamation at you. Mm. And there seems to be a part of it it, missions is missions and proclamation preaching. But there's another part in the kingdom where it's just being. It's just being uh, a preservation. It's just being a creating taste in people. It's just being yeah. revealing both the truth and the sin. And and a lot of times our life can be that powerful. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you could, these metaphors are uh, endless. Brilliant. I mean, it's, get into the chemistry, get into the atomic structures. You know, like, what is light? Is it a particle? Is it a beam? You know, like, there's so many things that you could you could start drawing out. And yeah. Saying, let's let's dive into it, and that's where I was just saying for tonight. Let's focus on this one thing, which is, this is a description of your identity. This is it's, who it you was are. gorgeous. This is who you are. Yeah. Let's figure out what that looks like. Let's figure out what that means. But just start here. This is uh, this is how you should respond to these persecutions. Not very hiding, running away, being angry. But remembering that you are the city on the hill. You are the light of the world. You are the preservation power of the world. You are the flavor. You are the right? the gift of life to the world. It's, yeah. So how do people lose their saltiness, in your opinion? Christians, how do they do that? I don't know how salt loses saltiness. Like, there's obviously something to that that I've never grasped because... Um, Kind of like salt is there until it's not there. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> maybe some, I don't know. I probably like if you're a chemist and you want to explain it to me, I, I'd right. love to hear it. But to me, the chemical structure of salt, it is salt until it is used. 
or dissolved or turns into something else. I mean, it, it's, I don't know how it can be not salty. How do you help with that? That's how do, how does the light become dimmer in a Christian's life? Well, you, you try to hide it. Right? Okay. That one he helps us with. Right, he does. Yeah. You're right. No, you're <laughs> exact. People don't hide it. People don't put it in some strange place. They put it out where everybody can see it because right. that's what it's for. That's its function. You know, it's in the same way, like the, the how does salt change? How do we not be salty? Right. I, I wave the flag of, I actually don't know that one. I've looked, I've thought about it. I've tried to dream up scenarios and I, I just, I'm missing it somehow or another. I'm missing salt not being salty we'll, we'll do that one together yeah maybe there's something to it. beatitudes those first 12 verses mm -hmm. what is the relationship between those first 12 verses and the next three chapters in your mind why why that and and is it is it an introduction to the next three chapters is there some relationship that's different between those 12 and the next three chapters what do you see there well, I mean, the obvious easy draw is to say this is some sort of uh, counterpart to the Ten Commandments, okay. uh, Christian law. Right. But, I mean, a, a basic reading of both of those side by side, you go, no, they're not. Right. Uh, obviously, they're clearly something else. And I really do see them as that uh, description of this is who you are as a follower of Christ. This is like your description of your character, your nature, your being. And... You need to return to that as you go through times of judgment, struggle, divorce, lust. I mean, all, all the things that are coming that are going to be talked about, um, they, you, you return back to, why, why shouldn't you do this? Well, because this is who you are. And this is the kind of character that should be exhibited from you. So I think it's maybe an anchor for the character uh, yeah. as, you, as you move through the rest of the scenarios that are about to be brought up. And there will be many. Yeah, there are. Great job tonight, Ryan. I appreciate it. Thank uh, you. It really is. I'm going to pray for us. Uh, enjoy your day. And um, we thank you for what God's doing in our church and Amen. through this guy and our future. And it's all good stuff. So Excellent. let me pray. Father, we again thank you uh, for the teaching. We thank you for the clarity, the specificity, the power. Um, May we uh, take it into our hearts. May it become part of our character. We, may we immerse ourselves in it. May it change the way that we live. May we be salt and light wherever we go, that we would reveal you in our story and cause people to be drawn toward you. Mm. So um, may we all live these truths this week, this day, and this moment. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have you. a great day. Uh, we'll see you later. Hey, what are you going to teach on next week? Do you know yet? Can you tell us? The next section. You're going to go right into yeah. that section? Okay, I didn't know. Cause you, <laughs> you skipped 6, 7, 8, like 9, it. and 10 give it, I give in it. the middle? I give no? it to you in the devotions. Did I week? miss it? Okay. Bill, I, Bill's ooh, not reading his devotions. No, no, I didn't realize the relationship. Now, that's an important thing for people to know. <laughs> that sometimes the devotion is not just a reflection on what was taught, yep. but could be. So for those that were paying attention. Yeah, okay. Which maybe not everybody. Not everybody. But for those who were paying attention, I did tell them in the service and showed them where to go sign up for the devotion. I saw that. I told them that the next three Beatitudes would be in there. It Good. was my, um, my way to incentivize people to to get a hold of those devotions. Love it. Because Ian does such a good job putting them together. There you go. <laughs> Don't do what I did. Um, well, I... Ask questions on, on camera. Yeah, yes. Don't do that. Yeah, never <laughs> ask a question you don't know the answer to, right? <laughs> That's right. All right, you guys have a great day. Thanks. We'll see you soon. Goodbye.